Okay, well thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being here so very much. My name is Lily Taylor. This is my husband, Skip. And we'd like to open up tonight with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just are so grateful for everything that you have provided. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our amazing pastors. Thank you, Father, for everything that you have provided that has helped us to walk through every difficult season and get here to this time. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to please move some hearts, open some doors, bring some healing and some peace that might be needed. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, <laughs> we're going to share some things with you tonight that um, we thought we'd probably start our evening by talking a little bit, kind of going back in time, sharing a little bit more of the story, just little snippets, maybe some things that you didn't get from the book if you've already started reading, and then we're going to pull those truths out of it, because obviously we're here because we want to share with you some things that we learned while we were walking through a difficult season. This was many years ago now, almost 15 years ago that this started, but yet when we walked through it, we there's so many deep and dark seasons. It could have gone so many different directions. But God, in the fullness of time, we saw him do some amazing things. And we really just could not not share it. And so that's why we're here tonight. So let me go back in time then. About 15 years. Well, 20, 2007. We were standing in, the, in our home. We were, we were home that night. This is, a, this is a picture of the home. We're going to call it the house on the hill. And I just want to set the scene for a moment. We were living in a beautiful little hill country town, somewhere near San Antonio, yet to be unnamed. But uh, we felt like we had kind of reached some goals in our life. You know, at that time, uh, Skip was a, a high-level executive with a healthcare firm. I was an up-and-coming corporate lawyer. We were working for the same company. We really just we really active in our church. We had a, a two children at home still. And we just really kind of felt good about this place in our lives. We felt like the house on the hill kind of represented some goodness that was happening in our lives because we were kind of late bloomers. Is there anybody else in the room who's a little bit of a late bloomer? I was uh, very old when I got out of law school. My husband was pretty old when he became a CPA. We had just kind of wandered around, took the circuitous route to success, and this started to feel like, like home, like we had built something. So um, just to kind of put that in context, the one thing that was sort of missing from our lives a little bit, we did have a hole in our hearts a little bit, and that hole was really our oldest son. He wasn't living there with us. Uh, we had hopes and dreams for him to go to college, to have that life that we were trying to build. You always project your, your hopes and dreams of your that you want for yourself onto your children. So we were assuming that he would go to law school one day or become a CPA or a dentist or you know, <laughs> something like that. But he seemed to be drifting through life, through his early 20s, just not connected to us, not connected to church, didn't seem to, not going to school, you know, all those hopes that we had for him didn't seem to be happening, and we, did, we, weren't, we didn't feel close. Probably every time he came by the house, we'd probably beat him over the head, to be honest. We'd, Why aren't you in school? What are you doing? What kind of job are you going to get? And just filling him full of our advice that we thought was the right thing for his life. No wonder he didn't come over, right? But that, that, was, that was hurting us, but at the same time, we, we felt like we were always extending our open arms for him to be there with us, that this was, you know, the family that you could have. So fast forward one night, we're standing there in 2007, and you can't see right now, but now you can see more of it. Skip had built himself the man cave, Skip had built himself the man cave of all man caves at this house. He had a, a the, the place was about four cars wide, he had a workshop in the back, this was a, this was a man's garage. He even separated it from the house for some reason so that maybe I wouldn't go out there. <laughs> he really kind of claimed it and staked it out as his space. So he's standing in that, in that space one night, and our oldest son Stephen drove up. And they were chatting out there. For some reason, he didn't come inside that night or, or eat, because usually he would love to eat with us, and then he would just leave. But he didn't eat that night. They were just talking. And at some point in the conversation, he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, you know, save some money, 
Can I put it in your safe? And in, yeah, instantly got this Holy Spirit radar. You got a bad feeling. He said, son, I can't take any money off of you. I don't know how much money you're talking about, but it's not going to go in my safe. And nothing of yours of any value is going to go in my safe. If there's something that you're involved in that is not right, you need to get away from it right now. Something in his spirit told him right that minute to give that advice. It chatted a little bit longer. It didn't come up again. Stephen drove off. And, uh, you know, it got, caused us a little bit of anxiety. That's a strange request. <laughs> so, but years went by. It really wasn't that long after that strange conversation on the driveway that uh, he ended up moving from where he was living to back to Austin, uh, moved in with his girlfriend, seemed to be happier, seemed to have a little more purpose. Years went by, we never heard anything about it, so we assumed that it was just, a, we don't know, one of those mysterious questions that we don't know the answer to. But one day after church, our youngest son was uh, in his room doing the social media thing that all young teenagers do. He was in middle school at the time. And he came running out of his bedroom and he said, Mom and Dad, uh, Kylie's calling me. Actually, she's messaging me. We didn't even understand what that meant at the time. She sent him a message through social media. We didn't even know that was possible at the time because she didn't know his phone number or ours. So. She said to call, that it was an emergency. So we called her, and she told me that their house had just been raided by the DEA. And Stephen was in jail. Well, he'd never been in jail before. We don't know anybody that's ever been to jail before. This was new to us, okay? This was not something that we were like, oh, here's the bondsman. Here's the attorney. Better call Saul. We didn't have any of that. We didn't know what to do. So... Skip got on, you know, got to calling people, and then the next morning he called the, the federal courthouse based on what Kylie had told us, and he found out that there was going to be an arraignment hearing. So he made plans to go to this arraignment hearing, and, and I'm going to take a little, little quick detour. Some of the feelings that are talked about in this story, um, you know, a lot of you are probably going to ask me when we get into our breakup session, breakout sessions, where is your voice? <coughs> Really, This is a story about a dad and a son, and you apparently lived through 27 years of this, so where is your voice in the story? So I, I thought maybe I should tell you that right now. Um, one of the reasons for that, and we can talk more about all these things when we're in our breakout session, but it was too painful for me to write it down if my own feelings were coming out. This is what happened to me today, because I, I journaled. I journaled all these years when we went to visit, everything that happened, I journaled it. But if I went to write it down and I put, today, this happened and I made this phone call, I, I couldn't write. But if I wrote, Skip took this call and this is what he heard, it would come out and it would just fill up pages and pages and pages. And the other reason that my voice is missing from the story is that I just could see how well he was handling it. What a godly, amazing, mature believer that he was throughout this experience. And I was so inspired by both he and Stephen and what they learned. And all through the process, I, I would always think to myself, why am I not growing like they are? Why well, do I seem to handle it not as well as my husband? And so I never did want to put some of those feelings into the story. And some of the feelings that Skip felt in the story are actually more like me. He was pretty much a, a rock most of the time. So he was a rock when he went to this hearing. He literally sat there and listened to what was coming out of the judge's mouth. So at an arraignment hearing, they tell you what you're being charged with. This is why you've been picked up, and this is why you're in prison. This is what we are going to try to prove, so that you can then call a lawyer and try to prove your own case. So I was not there that day, but Skip was there, and he heard what the judge said, and it was earth-shattering. It was earth shattering for us. We had never ever assumed we would ever be associated with anybody going, getting in trouble for these things. And then another interesting thing happened. Skip was sitting there thinking to himself, well, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next, but we're going to call Lily in a minute. We're just going to work through it. And as he sat there, the, the prosecuting attorney said, you know, I'm also going to ask the judge to consider the bond for a moment. And I'm going to call Agent Honeywell to the stand, 
and a man got up and went to the stand, and Skip got another shot while he was sitting there. He realized that he had seen that man before. When you stand standing there, that night, that happened, when they had that conversation, almost three years prior, Agent Honeywell had been sitting in a van across the street from our house, dressed as a painter. And a car had come right around the corner and shown his headlights right into that painting van, such that Skip got a photographic image of this man's face, and three years later he saw him standing there. So at that moment when he called me, we both knew our lives are not going to be the same. Right? Our lives are not going to be the same. It's going to change us. And what we thought we had is really just about to wash away like shifting sands. Right? So that's a little part of the story. That's it for tonight. Uh, we'll talk, talk more, answer your questions. But now I want to shift to something else. I want to shift to some things that God did during this period. Because he is so good. He is so amazingly sovereign that no matter what you go through, hopefully none of you are ever going to go through anything like that. Hopefully you've never had a prodigal. Hopefully you don't have a, a sister or a brother that's, that's estranged from you. But let's be real. Most of us will have some earth-shattering problem with our family at some point in our lives. It's just the fact that we live in a broken world. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, this is the first thing we're going to talk about tonight. And how am I doing? We are going to talk about our five pillars. And the first one is that we have to understand that the family is God's design. The family that you live in, the one that you have, is God's design. And he designed it from the very beginning to be blessed. In Genesis 1.28, he tells Adam and Eve, who he's just created, his first words to them are, I'm gonna bless you. I bless you. Go out and be fruitful and multiply. That was the first thing he said to them. Family's going to be important. So we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, just briefly, about the fact that when you're going through something with your family, one of the first things you need to do, if you're a believer, is this. You need to seek God with all your heart and all your soul live righteously, and he will give you everything you need, and you have to believe that. Because when you're facing a, a, a situation that you have no idea how to handle, maybe it's a health problem. But for us, it was a legal problem, and I'm a lawyer! But I don't have any idea, I don't practice criminal law, I don't know any criminal lawyers, I don't, I don't even know the criminal rules of civil procedure. Apparently I knew them well enough to pass the bar, but then I, you know, <laughs> erased that part of my brain. So we didn't have, we didn't really were just we had no idea what was going to happen next or who to call. But that doesn't matter because it does not matter what the problem is. We do know who to call. God is the answer. Whether it's a problem in your marriage, a problem with your kids, a problem with your sister, a problem with your parents. He really does hold the keys to everything that you're going to need. And we have five total things we're going to talk about. Hopefully, if you stay with us, if, if you decide not to come back next week, we'll sort it to two. <laughs> but... These are pretty important. And when you look at them, you're going to say, oh, yeah, she's going to talk about prayer. Everybody knows we're supposed to pray. No, we're going to talk about the power of intercessory prayer. We have combed and scoured the Bible for these truths because we needed something to support us. When we heard that our life was about to fall apart, our world was going to fall apart, we woke up the next morning and we said, wait, we can't let us fall apart. We've got people to lead at work. We've got two more children at home. We're going to have to get up every day and go to work. Well, all the life and breath and emotional energy was just out of us. But we still had to lead. We still had to do the things that God had tasked us with to do. So we had to learn a lot about intercessory prayer. And the Bible says a lot about the power of intercessory prayer. We want to show you everything we've learned from the Bible about intercessory prayer. We want to tell you about how not to let it steal your joy. This is, this is a long season for us. There was times when, you know, we, we, we would work all week, we worked 60 hour jobs, and then we would go to see him on a Saturday and that would take up eight hours. So we literally, and then we would go to church on Sunday, so we literally didn't get a weekend. We didn't get anything to replenish our tank. We were exhausted. But I'm sure it was nothing compared to what he was going through. 
But there, there are some very good tactical things. Anyway, you'll get the whole, the whole five if you stick with us, and I, and I hope they'll be really. Number four is powerful too. You're here tonight in Christian community, but there's some things we want to say about unity. Unity and Christian community are a little bit different, and we want to unpack that because you know we're all, we're all a hot mess, right? We all have something in our lives that's messed up, we, and we have different political views, maybe, or we have different ways of looking at the world, and this is a very divisive time in our world, and we've never needed that power of Christian community more than we have needed it today in 2022. So I hope you'll stay with us so that we can unpack all four, five of these things, and tonight let's just talk a little bit more about item number one, because I don't want to cut into Skip's time. Let's skip through this and go to the next one, too. I want to, I want to introduce a theme here. When we started studying the Bible, like we had never studied it before, and, and I'm going to tell you, we, we started studying the Bible. This is our 11th year to read it every day, the whole thing in a year. And we started, like it was just like, it was like a drug for us. I started out reading other self-help books, and I love you know, Priscilla Shire and, and Beth Moore, and there was just a lot of great content out there, and I read all of it. But nothing quenched my soul when I was going through the dark night of the soul like God's Word, the Bible, in context, read it every day. And when I got to the book of Nehemiah that first year in 2008, it spoke to me in a way that had never spoken to me before. I took this picture in Spain. Uh, it's obviously a picture of a wall that's been broken down. And I also found a picture of the next slide is another gal that I, I read her blog post. And she said that this is actually part of Nehemiah's wall. I couldn't verify that, so I can't give you the citation, but she, she indicated in her post that this was a picture she took in Israel. And I love the image there because that is how I felt. I felt that, the, I, felt that I had been walking around for 30 years with a protective bubble over my head thinking that if I just went to church, if I was just a good person, my world was not going to fall apart. But yet it had. But yet Skip was handling it better. He was walking around saying, we're going to get through this. We're going to be fine. But I did not feel that way. And so one night while I was praying, God started giving me this image of these stones. And the first way he gave me the image of the stones was that I was going to go make myself a little cairn. You know what a cairn is? Like a little altar of stones, like the 12 stones that the Israelites made when they made their, their monument after they went through the, the river. Well, and then eventually when I got to the book of Nehemiah, I started seeing this vision that I could put a spiritual wall around my family. And that's what these five lessons are about. How to get up every day and feel like you are putting one more brick, one more stone in this spiritual wall around your family. Because if your family is God's design and he wants you to be, he, he made you for a purpose to be with these people that you are with then he will protect it. And our weapons that we fight with are not just physical, like these big stones were to the Israelites, but they are spiritual. And I love Nehemiah. Does everybody love Nehemiah? Isn't that one of your favorite? But most people talk about Nehemiah from a you know, perspective of leadership. They don't really talk about it as a family story. But if you read the book of Nehemiah, his prayers are so, so powerful. He starts with confession. He puts God in remembrance of all the promises that he made to the Israelites. He praises God, and then he asks. And I learned a lot from Nehemiah's prayers. And I also felt sorry for him, because he is anybody in here have like their old family place? Anybody have a ranch, or a, just a couple of acres that grandma had, or something like that? I know, I know Tenzin and Jimmy, they have a big place. <laughs> it's kind of their family homestead. Can you imagine if that place that you thought was your family's legacy was stolen from you? Just completely stolen and didn't belong to your family anymore. And then what if you thought that God had given that to your family and it was just gone? Nehemiah was so heartbroken for his loss. So that's my, that's my image. And that's, but, but as I started to see this wall, it started to get more and more powerful. It started to get more and more protective. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the fact that community and family is so precious to God, and I don't want us to forget that. He lives in Holy Trinity communion himself. He created Adam and Eve as his most special creation. He blessed them, 
And then what happened to the family? Right, what happens in the very next verse after, he, after they start their family almost? I mean, we don't get a lot of growing up period, right, in, in Genesis about what happens to the boys. We just know that pretty soon Cain kills Abel. And the very first family of God's design is already under attack. Why do you think Satan is so against the family? That's where our protection lies. And if he can get you alone, or to feel like you're alone, then he can have more impact on you. So it's very, very key for us to remember that our family is worth protecting with our prayers. Our family is worth reconciliation. You may have someone in your family that you think you can't reconcile with. Maybe, you, maybe you're on one side of the political spectrum and they're on the other. But you know what? You should be praying for them. You should be envisioning this wall of protection around them. That your prayers are like a shield of faith over them. Because God's design is to build beautiful things through your family line. And if you walk around declaring that and remembering that, it helps you to deal with wherever you are today. So even if today it's not perfect, even if today they're out in the wilderness, you know in your heart, I'm at home doing everything I can do. And this is what made me feel so positive about this message, is for a long time, for a few years, I felt helpless. I felt hopeless. What can I do? I mean, the, the US federal government came and took him away. I have no tools in my toolkit. And that was so wrong. That was so wrong to feel helpless and hopeless like that because I do have tools. I have big tools. I have the bigger tools <laughs> than any, any prosecutor anywhere. And I am building that wall every single day around our family. Do you have one or two more slides? Oh, I want to talk a little bit about marriage. Okay, skip on. Real fast. If you are married and you have a problem with one of your children, that can be so so hard on your marriage. It can tear your marriage apart. And we went through this twice. We have two boys that have had serious challenges. And it, you have to remember that mothers get sad and dads get mad. <laughs> so it's very, you're very different in the way you want to handle it, right? The mother wants to nurture. We're talking about a 17-year-old who the dad is saying, I think he needs to leave. He can't live in my home and bring marijuana into my house. No, he has to go. And then the mother, of course, is saying, well, if we put him out on the street, then he'll have more exposure to drugs. We need to at least keep him here. So there's a lot of stress that can happen in your marriage. It's very important that you put your marriage right behind your relationship with God. So remember we talked about seeking God first? You have to go deep into that. Deep into that. It can't just be like I go to church on Sunday. It's like you're reading your Bible every day. And then you're putting your marriage really at a high point and you're you know, right up there because even if your spouse is making you crazy with the fact that they want or you feel very opposed to what they want to do you need to stop right there and pray with each other because your marriage is another thing that satan wants to destroy and you can't let that happen also if you're not married it's it's just good to know that two are better than one and when you have god in your life you have two you have more than two because I talk to sometimes a few, sometimes single moms will find me somehow on the internet or you know somewhere website, and they'll say, "I feel like you had such an amazing help because you had this amazing godly man, and I don't have that." God can fill every void. He can fill every need. He is a husband to the husbandless, father to the fatherless, and He will make a way. Yes, He will. Amen. And finally. Well, we can close with this. I just want you to, to I'm going to leave you with Joel 2.25. Uh, I was interviewed on a, on a podcast the other day, and um, I said, they, they, you know, they, they send you all these questions at first, and they're like, because they're going to try and get to know you so they can ask the right questions, because they never read your book before they interview you. And so uh, they said, what is your life verse? And I told them, Joel 2.25, and the, the interviewer, the podcast host that was reading it, she looked it up like in the King James Version, and it says, God can restore what the canker worm has eaten, yeah. and she thought I was totally crazy <laughs> for picking that verse. And you know what my version, the New Living Translation says? I will give you back what you have lost. I will give you back what you have lost. And so if you have anything in your life that is a whole, anything that is missing, it is not too lost for God. Amen?
I'll stop right there and we'll break up and I'll see you later.